Eve, that God can make her pregnant. And then Hashem asks her, why did you laugh? She denies it and lies. No one looked it up, huh? No. I'm not going to look. Um, the book is in the library. You can actually see it if you want. But let's focus on, on this week's parsha. Before we start the sikha, I have a story to tell, but I'll leave a story for the end of the class if we have time. Something that's not relevant to the sikha, but I want to ask kids on the parsha. The bracha that Yitzchak gives, wants to give Esav. Of course, Yaakov gets the bracha. Okay. Yitzchak believes Esav deserves it, and Rivka believes Yaakov deserves it. Oh, so there's no of there. Why couldn't Rivka and Yitzchak get together at the dinner table? Why couldn't Rivka simply converse with Yitzchak and tell Yitzchak, Esav is not the child worthy of your blessing? Why did she, I mean, it's a crucial time over here. I mean, it's really crucial. She put Yaakov in danger. Why didn't she let Yitzchak know beforehand that Yaakov is the, the child that deserves the bracha, not Esau? It's wonderful. At first glance, what you're probably gonna say is that she didn't wanna break his heart. She didn't want to break it to him. After all, Yitzchak wasn't that well, he was already blind, and uh, he was not willing to say Lashon Hara about her son. Okay. But there's a deeper answer than that. It wasn't that Rivka and Yitzchak, uh, you know, were hiding things from each other for the sake of just hiding so we don't find out who Asa really is. It had to be this way. Yaakov had to receive the bracha stealthily, not directly, but through putting on Aesop's clothing and acting as if he is Aesop. Why? Because Rivka, the great Rivka, saw, foresaw, she cared about Aesop too. But she foresaw that the only way Aesop can be refined is not with Yitzchak's blessing, because he's not ready for it, that's like giving a drug addict money. It's gonna go to the wrong sources. The way Aesop can be refined is this of Yaakov. And that might take a few thousand years. In other words, Yaakov has to, how does Yaakov affect Aesop? You gotta go into Aesop's clothing, into Aesop's shoes. It's the idea that you have to be able to relate to the outside non-Jewish world in order to affect them. Wearing Aesop's clothing, when Yaakov wore Aesop's clothing and he said, I am, I am Aesop, he wasn't lying. Rashi says, he said, I am common, whoever I am. Aesop is your firstborn. <laughs> but according to Hasidus, Yaakov really wasn't lying. He became so much identified with Esau's lifestyle that he acquired it in order to be able to acquire his ways of behavior, but he acquired the ability to relate to Esau, putting on his clothing as a metaphor of understanding Esau's passion. And only then was he able to really affect, eventually affect Esau, which will take place completely when Mashiach comes. It's a process. Rivka foresaw that. If you give Yaakov the bracha without any, without Esau, any connection with Esau, then the world, the Goyesha world, can never be refined. Rivka foresaw all the way up to be a Samashiach. Of course, you know, she and, and Yitzchak could have talked things over, but then that would defeat the whole purpose. Because if Yaakov gets the bracha and Esau is left out, Esau remains out of the picture. And, uh, and Rivka did not want the non-Jewish world, the Rome, the Goyish world of Rome to be out of the picture altogether. Hashem wants refined Goyim too. Okay, that's one thing. I have another question to ask you on the Parsha. Hakol kol Yaakov. Hmm, sounds like Yaakov. But how you die, you Okay, I'll give you a bracha. Give me the benefit of the doubt. 
if I curl, curl Yaakov, if Yaakov sounds like Yaakov and not like Esau, doesn't that raise, uh, raise some kind of uh, suspicion? Why did he give him the bracha nonetheless? He was very careful to make sure, hey, come here, come here, you know. And then all of a sudden, he sees, uh, you know, a little bit of a hakol kol yakov, no good. Why you dying today, Esau, and by your So I saw one of the commentaries gives a very cute answer. Esau, before leaving to hunt, or you get the blessing, told Rivka, told Yitzchok, Tati, father, I'm afraid Yaakov's going to fool us. So you know what? I will mimic his voice. So if you hear someone with his voice and my, you'll know it's me. He will probably try to sound like Asa. He will try to play the trick and sound like me. So if you hear anybody that sounds like me, you know it's not me. But if it sounds like Yaakov, then it's me. So you would very good. Hakoil Kol Yaakov, as per our conversation that we had, yes. You sound like Yaakov, which means you're Asa, and you, you feel like yeah, and you feel like Asa, so you're Asa. That's just a, a cute answer to a question that always bothered me, but there's probably deeper answers to that than this, this answer. Um, the story I wanted to tell, I'll tell a little bit later. It's a story, fascinating story. It doesn't have much to do with the Sikha, but it actually does. So we'll start the Sikha first. Sikha, thanks to Devorah, we have it available. Um, Can we speak that? Oh, of course. Who didn't get the paper? The English. That's the English. Who wants more? I have the Hebrew also. Oh, that's the brilliant. What do you have against English? Here's English and Hebrew. Yes, of course. Hebrew? Uh, no, this is just Hebrew. Okay. This is Hebrew here. Yeah. Here's the English. The English. And the Hebrew, I don't have an extra one. Okay. Okay, we're going to, the Sikha is going to be discussing Esau's relationship with Yitzchak, Yishmael's relationship with Avraham. Who is closer to whom? Who is more affected by their respective fathers? Whose relationship to their respective fathers was deeper? It wasn't that deep. Neither of them were that deep because Avram and Yitzchak go together, Yitzchak and Yaakov go together. Let's take the aliens, the ones that are estranged to their religion. Of the two, which one had a deeper relationship with their fathers? That's the sequence going to be discussing this. And we're going to quote a medrash at the beginning. You look at the English or the Hebrew. In the English here, so it says the Midrash comments on the verse, and these are the descendants of Yitzchak. It starts off the words, Ve'ele toilda is Yitzchak. Ve'ele, with a vow. And, usually you don't, you don't begin a sentence with the word and. So it must be that this parsha is connected to the previous parsha, which discusses who? Yishmael and his descendants. Not very good people. And then, with this week's parsha, and, and meaning same subject we're discussing not good people and these are the children of Yitzchak referring to Esau who was just like Ishmael just like Ishmael was estranged from his father so was Yitzchak estranged from his I mean uh, Esau estranged from his parents it's a very strange beginning the Torah of this week's parsha begins with Esau Look in the next few in English here. And these are the descendants of Yitzchak. And these comes to add on to the previously mentioned. The children of Yishmael who were mentioned earlier. To whom does this, to whom does this refer? Who is like Yishmael? It refers to Esau, the son of Yitzchak. Avram had a son that didn't behave. And so did Yitzchak. His son is Esau. Meaning, by saying, and these are the descendants of Yitzchak, the Torah refers to Esau, who like the children of Yishmael was wicked. This is why the word told us is written lacking the second letter 
usually told us it's spelled with two vavs. Here it's spelled with one vav. Why with one vav? To allude that Yaakov was not included in this word told us. We're excluding Yaakov. We're only talking about the bad ones. Last week, Yishmael, Ve'ele, and likewise Yitzchak had a bad son. So what's strange here is that I've asked two questions. We need to clarify. Since the Midrash interprets the phrase, and these are the descendants of referring to Esau, we must say that according to this interpretation of the Midrash, the primary emphasis of the verse is not Yaakov, but on Esau, which is puzzling. The in other words, the Torah is telling you that the beginning of the parsha is about Esau. That's strange. If the beginning of the parsha, the actual word told us, is, is referring to Esau, that would mean the entire parsha is Esau oriented. Really? No, it's not. Where do we find in the parsha a greater emphasis on Esau over Yaakov? But more importantly, in the first place, how can we say that the phrase, and these are the descendants of Yitzchak, means Esau and not Yaakov? How could you exclude Yaakov from the descendants of Yitzchak? Who is more of a descendant? Yaakov, of course. So how can you say that Eila told us? I know you're saying told us without a verb, but still, these are the offshoots, the offsprings of Yitzchak, and you're only referring to Esau and his family. Very strange. So in the Hebrew, I'm not going to the Hebrew. We're going to skip the Hebrew just for this part, and we'll go back to the Hebrew in a minute. Um, a little more English, then we'll go back to the Hebrew. In general, the explanation is as follows: the theme of Parshas Toldos is the affairs of Yitzchak. I don't mean affairs; I mean his avoda, his service to God, the events of his life, his descendants, his journey to Gerar, name of the city where he dug wells, his digging wells, which we'll see is a very important part of Yitzchak's life, and his blessings to his sons. That's the parsha. The novelty of Yitzchak's avoda over Avram's avoda, which is described in last week's parsha, was expressed in how Yitzchak's spiritual relationship with Esau was different than Avram's relationship with Yishmael, as will be explained. In other words, by looking at how, at how Yitzchak's relationship with Yishmael was different than uh, I'm sorry, with Esau, it was different than Avram's with, Yish with Yishmael, is a derivative of how Yitzchak's service to God was different than Avram's. Because Yitzchak served God in a certain way, not like Avram, we'll soon see what that was, that's why his relationship with Yishmael was quite different than Avram's with, uh, with I'm saying again, with Yitzchak with Esau than Avram with Yishmael. I'm a little tired today. So again, because Avram and Yitzchak had very, very different ways of serving Hashem, as we'll soon see, almost opposite ways. Therefore, the estranged child that each one had, had a different relationship. Based on the relationship that Avram and Yitzchak had with Hashem, how they related to the outside world, how they did Avodah Hashem outreach, based on these two methods of outreach, they had different kinds of relationship to their estranged children. So if you want to know Yitzchak's Type of avoda, look at Esau. When we say avoda, we don't mean his avoda for himself, his avoda in outreach. If you want to understand Yitzchak's way of affecting people, you study Esau's relationship with Yitzchak. If you want to understand Avram's relationship to the world out there, you look at Ishmael. They are embodiments that personify, exemplify their parents' outreach avoda. There's outreach avoda, then there's inner. Avram's inner level of service, Yitzchak, of course, manifested that. Yitzchak's inner service to Hashem, Yaakov. But when you talk about their relationship to the world out there, they have two other sons. But the two sons that they had were very different to their fathers, as we'll see right further. Um, okay. Therefore, the parasha begins with the phrase, these are the descendants of Yitzchak, I, which means Esau. That is the name and subject of this parasha, which is told us, which also refers to told us in the sense of Yitzchak's abode. That told us means children and also can mean Yitzchak's, his fruits, how he served Hashem and his actions, is discernible in the fact, when do you notice Yitzchak's type of service? 
in terms of his outreach, in the fact that Asav is, the next page in English, Asav is referred to as the one with whom Yitzchak enjoyed a unique relationship. As it says, these are the descendants of Yitzchak and Asav. So there's a certain interesting relationship that Asav had with Yitzchak, as we of course see it. Asav loved Yitzchak. But that's not what we're going to discuss so much, his love for Yitzchak. In fact, just by the way, completely off the subject, one of the reasons why Rivka had to have this whole, another answer to our question we asked before, why is it that Yaakov had to get the blessing in stealthily by stealing it from Esau? Because in order for the blessing to take place, to take effect on Yaakov, listen to this, he had to counteract Yitzchak's incredible uh, respect for his father. Yitz, I mean, um, Esau, respect for his father. Esau respected Yitzchak incredibly. In fact, it says we should come to, it's very difficult to come to the, to the uh, foot strides of Esau's incredible uh, self-sacrifice in serving Yitzchak. He was, he, ex he was excelled in that. If he excels in that, that's dangerous. Ya uh, Yaakov has to also show that he's willing to have Mesir Nefesh to listen to his mother. So Rivka says, I need you to do something very risky and dangerous. Put on Esau's clothing in disguise because if you do that, even though your life is in, you know, you're, you can curse you. If that were to happen, you're risking. But you have to take this risk in order to honor your mother. And the honor of your mother will offset the ace of honoring his father. And now we're even. Now the bracha can take effect. It's an interesting, not related to the sikha, but I wanted to share that with you. Siras nefesh for kibbut aim versus masiras nefesh for kibbut av. I can throw in things here, here and there, just to throw in things. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. Okay, now the next part of the sikha. Um, let's look at the Hebrew for a second. It's on page 206. If you have the Hebrew, I'm going to read it in Hebrew and then in English. The Hevdo, actually, let's first see the italics, the dark words. Page 206 on top. The two opposites. There are two contrary ideas explaining the relationship that Yishmael had to Avram and Esau to Yitzchak. In other words, on the one hand, Esau was closer to Yitzchak than Yishmael was to Avram. On the other hand, it was the opposite. Here's how it goes. The Hevdil, concerning the difference between the bond and relationship, Connection that Yishmael had to Avram. Ubein hakesher shall Esav leYitzchak. Kayamim shnei hafachim. Exist two opposites. Mitzad echol. On the one hand, how Yishmael called of Yosef the Beruch is Avram. Yishmael was closer to Avram. May I share Esav leYitzchak? Why? Anyone? What's the obvious answer to that? Where do we see he was closer? Yishmael to Avram. Versus Ace of the Yitzchak. Where do we see that Ishmael was closer to Avram than Ace of the Yitzchak? Huh? No, no, no. What? No, no, no. Oh, what? One of the guys in yeah, it doesn't make it closer. <laughs> something. Well, something very simple. We want to change the, the bed of. Ishmael can change his bed. No. no, no. How did Ishmael end, end off his life? Chuba. He did Chuba. Did Esau do Chuba? No, sirree. Esau tried to stop the burial of Yaakov in the Mara Samachpelo. You know the whole story in the Mara. And he, his head was severed. He was beheaded by Yaakov's grandson called Chushim. Chushim did not have good hearing and he heard. He just saw. You want also? They don't like the class. Right. Uh, the. Um, Wait, so how is man who was such a one? Okay. How? How do you, what do you think influenced him? Who was Fiala? Allah? Me, Avram. So Avram's Hashpa finally had an effect, impact on Ishmael. Yitzchak did not succeed in getting Ace of the children. He's even at the very last day of his life, he tried to stop the burial of Yaakov, only to lose his life. He was beheaded. The very same day Yaakov passed away, on that same day, by the burial site, Esau lost his head, and his head rolled into the Ma'aras Machpelah. And we'll soon talk about this. 
on Yitzchak's bosom, on his lap, which is a very strange thing. We'll say it's kind of not, you know, it's a funny, I mean, it's not funny, it's a whatever. We'll soon see later in the Sikha that ever talks about this. <coughs> so Esau didn't do tshuva. On the one hand, Yishmael did. So obviously, you pick Yishmael as being much closer to Avram than Yitzchak relationship with Esau. He was much closer, but Ruchni is spiritually to Avram. May Asher Esav le Yitzchak, and Esav was a Yitzchak. Shara Yishmael calls her a tshuva, the Chayyab. Yishmael returned with tshuva in the lifetime of his father. Benire, and it appears, Shahoya Zebik Lal Hashpaz Avram Allah was because of Avram's influence. The Elo Allah Esav, Ain Moitzim Shechaz of a tshuva, the Eifach. You don't find that he did tshuva, the opposite is true. If you feel it's Chazal, Hamuska Bepirus Rashi. Rashi quotes the sayings of our sages in Gemara. Who ikev le'achar moto as kiburas Yaakov? He tried to stop Yaakov's burial in the Gemara Samach Pela. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, now who can cite the other side of the picture? Where is Esau's relationship with Yitzchak closer? That's a hard one. The answer is strangely enough, Esau was a Jewish rebel. Yishmael was a goy, a goyish about tshuva. He was a goy, in spite of his tshuva, he still remained non-Jewish. Esau, in spite of his not doing tshuva, was Jewish. A bad Jew, but Jewish he was. His connection to Yitzchak was intrinsic. Not his actions, but who he was. His identity was still like Yitzchak. He was a child that carried the title Jew whatever level of Jew existed before Matan Torah, not so clear what that is, but he was considered a descendant in terms of who he is. How did he act? Not the way that Yitzchak would act. Not at all, not even close, obviously. But Yishmael is the opposite. Not Jewish, no connection to Avram in terms of who he is, his intrinsic nature, identity, but his actions were good. To the extent that we have Tanoim, we have sages in the Gemara that are called Yishmael. And, and if you look into the Talmud, you'll see names of uh, scholars, Talmudic scholars, and also the Mishnah scholars had very famous, one of Rabbi Akiva's famous, one of his opponents, who argued a lot with him was Rabbi Yishmael. He did Shuvah. He's not Jewish. As the question is, what makes Esau more Jewish than Yishmael? We'll soon talk about that. Your first glance is going to be, who's the mother? Esau's mother was Rivka. Who was Ishmael's mother? Agar. Maybe that's what caused the difference. So Rebbe says that's not the difference. We'll soon see why. Let's first see the next thing. One more paragraph of Hebrew, and then we'll read English. Mitzad Shreini Avram. Gemara says, Yosav ben Nifrat himen Ishmael. Ishmael completely disconnected from his father, to the extent that his identity was not the same as his father, he wasn't a Jew. He wasn't uh, described as a Jew. He didn't have that title. He was not the Yorish, he was not the heir of Avram. He did not inherit Avram. And he admitted, Yitzchak, you're the real, the real heir, not me. As it says, Lo Yiraj Ben Yitzchak, this servant, this uh, son of a of a handmaid, will not serve or, or inherit together with my son Yitzchak. Lugumatot, conversely, Esav Lamrot, in spite of the fact Shagamhu Yotzav and Nifrad, he also went and parted with Yitzchak and went his own ways. As the Gemara says, Yitzchak Yotzav Mimenu Esav. Yisrael. He still remained a Yisrael. What kind of Yisrael? Yisrael Mumar. What's Mumar mean? Rebellious, a rebellious Jew. And he was a equal, uh, he was able to have the right to inherit Yitzchak's, um, Yitzchak's, you know, whatever he had, whatever he owned. Future Nema, Yerusha, and Sakli Esau. I've given a Yerusha to Esau. Okay. What's going on over here? Why is that? Why, why would this be? Why would Esau be intrinsically connected to Yitzchak in spite of his behavior? And Avram, Yishmael, in spite of his good behavior, still remain a non-Jew. How does that work? Um,
the Pashtus, says the Rebbe further. Nitin Hoyla Hasber. At first glance, we can explain it in the following way. He was not a Yorif because he was a son of a handmaid. His mother was not a real wife. Lachain, as the Pasuk says, Lo Yirav Ben Ha'ama Hazot Ibni. He's Ben Ha'ama. Ach Lo Ke Esav. Esav is not that way. Shrayi Benashul Rivko. Whoever refutes that. He's saying that if you're a maid, you're a handmaid, you can't be considered a real wife and your children won't be Jewish before the Torah was given. Well, how come Yaakov married Bila and Zilpa? They were they also weren't the real wives. They were also considered equal to Hagar. And yet all his children were considered Jewish. So we see it doesn't depend on the mother. It doesn't depend on the mother. So it has something to do with the father. Something to do with Avram and Yitzchak causes this change. Because Avram served Hashem in one way and Yitzchak in the other way. That's what decides the two opposites. On the one hand, if you're Yitzchak, your child will always have to be Jewish, but he won't not necessarily behave. If you're Avram's child, you will eventually get affected by it later on, but it's not going to make you Jewish. What exactly is it about Avram and Yitzchak's avoda, which manifested itself in their children who were alienated? Yes. Could it be that with Avram, they didn't necessarily have faith in Hashem, that they would have a child, so then Sarah's like marrying a daughter, have a child with her, yeah. and they didn't have that straight trust in Hashem that there would be a child. Um, so that's what, what about Bill or Zilpa? Same thing. True. I don't know. Okay, you don't have to answer. <laughs> this is a Sikha. This is a revolutionary Sikha. Everyone thinks that the answer to the question is the mother. But the Rebbe refutes that. That's not the answer. It has something to do with the father here. The Avram and Yitzchak, very different in how they serve Hashem, both holy, but very different when they're different ways. Um, that's the reason. But let's try to understand that. And before we do that, I wanted to say something and I forgot what I wanted to say. So let me give me a few seconds to remind me what I wanted to say. Um, uh, boy. Okay, I'll remember a little later. Okay, so that's the end of Gib Bay. Bay basically finishes off, chapter two finishes off with saying, don't use that mother difference as, as the answer. So now we go to Gimel. Let's see the English. Let's see the English, and then we'll go back to the Hebrew. Um, so what I just read here in Hebrew is, is two, or two to three. Now let's go to three in English. Esau's heavenly head. <laughs> Why did Yitzchak want to give Esau a blessing? I think that's what I want to say. Why did he want to give Esau a blessing? I mean, was he really blind? And I mean, blind was blind, but he couldn't see through Esau's ways who he was. Why did Yitzchak want to give Esau a bracha and not Yaakov? What did he see in Esau that made him so excited? So I want to tell you a little story. That someone said, well, Rashi says, you know, it's so simple because he bribed him with good food. And he was very nice to him, gave him a lot of food. In fact, it says in the words, ki tzayid b'thiv. What does tzayid b'thiv mean? Tzayid. He hunted and he gave him food in his mouth. And that's why Yitzchak loved Esau. So, you know, the president of Israel used to be Zalman Shazar many years ago, long before your time. And he was very close to Chabad. And he came to the Rebbe also. And there were a lot of, I don't want to mention who, certain kind of chassidim that were very against this. They believe Zionism is terrible. But there are other people who even weren't like that, anti-Zionist. They were anti the idea of uh, the Rebbe trying to bring someone who was not exactly, uh, you know, 100%. The Yiddish guy, although he came from a Chabad family, Rubash, his, name is, his name, real name was Rubashov. Shazar was not his real name. Zalman Rubashov, I think his name was. And he came from a dynasty, of, I mean, a descendants from Chabad, I believe. But he was not, you know, was traditional, but not really that religious. And the Rebbe would try to be the car of him. So he gave a lot to Chabad also. A lot of, he gave a lot of money to Chabad. So this one fellow, I want not to mention his name, obviously he wouldn't know him anyways. And this is back in 1968. Adafa Brangen, 
The Rebbe says, quotes this person saying that the Rebbe is just like Yitzchak. Yitzchak was bribed by Esau, gave him good food, and the Rebbe is bribed by Shazar, who gives the Rebbe money, and that's why the Rebbe treats him so nicely. So the Rebbe went on and said, that fact he compares me to Yitzchak, I don't mind. But the fact that he had the chutzpah to think that Yitzchak was bribed with food, let him go to the Maros of Aspela and let him plead for mercy that Yitzchak should not have any, anything against him. He, he, he has to apologize to Yitzchak Avinu for thinking so lowly of him. Yeah. What is the real reason of Nichasid is why Yitzchak wanted to give Esau a bracha? Because Yitzchak saw, especially in Esau's head, he saw chaotic energy, sparks from a very lofty world called Olam Hato, the world of chaos, which is much more lively and passionate about God than the world where Yaakov came from. Yaakov is a smooth ride. You know, you have some kids, they're very smooth. They sit and learn. They love to learn. Even during recess, they're always learning. Just, a, you know, a, a refined boy, a sweet boy, a sweet girl. They don't have, there's no, no avoid there's no struggles. They're just so pure and pristine. Then there's the Vildechai, is a wild kid energy, you know, and they, but they're, and they're doing all kinds of not good things, but their energy is incredible. If you harness that energy into Kedusha, wow. So Yitzchak was seeing that with his bracha, he will be able to draw down the sparks of chaotic energy that Asa possessed in his head and translate that to his actions, to the rest of his body, that he'll also behave properly. This is what Yitzchak foresaw. Rivka said, I understand you, my dear husband. She didn't say that to him, but this is what she was thinking. But Esau, he ain't ready for it. He's not ready. You're looking at him from a, from a, from a vantage point, from your level, from your world. You're overestimating Esau. Yes, he has that. I also see what you see. But he's not ready to have his behavior connect to that energy that's in his head. Esau had a holy head. We'll soon see what that means when we come to the next part of the Sikha. Um, okay, now, three. Well, uh, head from Tohu? Yeah, his head. It, the energy of Tohu was invested in his head. The head means, the, the, says a baby, when a baby is born, so the head is most connected to the parent than the rest of the body. The head, even though the head doesn't always come out first, but the head is the source of connection to the parent. So when Esau comes from Yitzchak, the root source of Esau's connection to Yitzchak is extremely holy. And that holiness, however, is, is limited. It's affected because the head and his body are connected. Esau's head is wonderful when it's disconnected. So we'll soon see. The problem with Esau is, we'll soon see in the sequel. Let's first see it inside here in English. The unique relationship between Yitzchak and Yishmael is also alluded to in the teaching of our sages that the head of Esau was buried in the bosom of Yitzchak. Now, this is very puzzling. We have a rule that you're not allowed to bury a Russia next to a tzaddik. This was the story I was going to tell you before. You're now allowed to bury a Russia next to a tzaddik. Yet we have a story in Tanakh where a false prophet was ambushed by a lion as a punishment for his false prophecy and was mauled and he was killed. There was a war going on and the enemy was chasing, chasing us and we didn't have time to bury this, dead, dead, this, this false prophet in a proper place. So he was buried on a spot right where we found him. And it happened to be very close to Elisha, the great Elisha, the Talmud of Eliyahu Navi. And burying a Russia next to a tzaddik was so wrong that God made a miracle. This dead guy rose, lived for a few minutes, and then died again and was buried somewhere else. So Hashem made the miracle of Tchias HaMesim not to allow a Russia buried next to a tzaddik. That being the case, how in the world does Yitzchak deserve that his ace of Russia, ace of the Russia, have his head, head of Esau, be buried next to Yitzchak and fall on top of his lap? How would Hashem allow that? So it must be that Esau's head, when it's beheaded, is holy. The problem with Esau is when the head and the body are connected, then the head loses its power 
the chaotic power that he had is invested in Klippa, in very negative energy, in killing people. He was a murderer. I also had a very big question. I'll, I'll, I'll throw you a few more questions in this week's parsha. You know how many sins that Esau committed that day? He came home with the lentil, red lentils. He uh, raped a young married woman. He murdered somebody. He denied Chiyas HaMesim, denied Hashem, and he also sold his birthright. Which one of those five sins were mentioned in Chumash? The smallest one. He sold his birthright. Why is that? Why is selling the birthright the biggest crime of all? It's the smallest crime. Murder? Raping? Young lady who's married? And yet this some seems to be the only one that's mentioned in Chumash. Question number two I have. If you're looking without Rashi, man is Rashi off the picture. Read the Chumash. Take Rashi out of the picture. No Medrash, no Rashi, just pure Bible, Bible study. Read the Pesukim. Esau does not sound like a bad guy at all. What did he do wrong? He was full. He was tired. Okay, he's not a learner. Yeah, he has no zitz flesh. He's not the type of kid that can learn. He's in the field. Doesn't say one word that he killed anybody in the Chumash. That's all Medrash, full outside. There's a lot of big deals. There are children that, you know, that are not tailor-made for learning. It doesn't make him a Russia. And he lost his, he sold his birthright because he didn't go, you know, he didn't think that it would that it would be a big deal. He was hungry, you know, he was very, very hungry, so he couldn't, so he sold it. He was extremely strong hungry. You know, what do I, I'm gonna die anyways, so what do I need it for? What's so terrible about that? And then when he says at the end of the parsha, I'm gonna kill Yaakov, how many times do we say when people get angry at each other, I'm gonna kill this person? You know, he said, I'm going to, he never did it. That doesn't make him a Russia, it makes him an angry, he was angry, he had reasons to be angry. Yaakov was the one who stole things from him. Stole his birthright, stole his, I mean, he still that, but he fooled him with that, and he stole his bracha. His reaction is, I'm angry. How come there's no clear cut mentioning in the parsha of Asa, parsha of, of his told us that Asa was a bad guy? It's only in the Rashi and the Medrash and the Gemara. In Shmuel, we do have a mentioning that he was a Vildachaya, Pera Odom. That's a pretty derogatory statement to make on a person. But when it comes to Asa, so the only answer I would think of, a simple answer, is the honor of, is in order not to um, disparage, dishonor Yitzchak and Rivka. Yitzchak and Rivka, two tzaddikim. It doesn't look nice for the Pasuk to actually have an elaboration of how simple he was. So although Rashi does fill you in, but the Pasuk totally leaves it out Figure it out yourself. We're not going to discuss openly in the holy words of the Chumash how evil Aesop actually was. Which would answer actually the first question too. We're going to deal with the smallest crime. He sold his birthright, not deal with the fact that he was uh, you know, a murderer and a rapist and so on and so forth. That's a separate issue. Okay. So the question is very obvious. How is it that Hashem allowed Aesop's head to fall into the Morris and Achpela. So the answer, yeah. So he says here in the English, it's very puzzling. According to Allah, we may not bury a wicked person next to a righteous person. The end of page, uh, of second page. And this is not a miracle. This is a, this is a miracle of all miracles. Resurrecting the dead is one of the greatest miracles. The false prophet was brought back to life to prevent him from lying next to, his, to, to Elisha. How then was it possible for Esau's head to have been buried in the bosom of Yitzchak? Doesn't make any sense. The question is accentuated. It says Esau Harosha's head. We're calling him a Russia, and we're saying this Russia's head is buried right near his father, right on top of his father. His, the head is. So the answer to the question is the explanation, Esau was a Russia only owing to his body. From the vantage point of his head, however, he was not a Russia. Since his head was severed from his body, separated from his crassness, on the contrary, he had a positive relationship with his father, Yitzchak, which is why his head remained in Yitzchak's bosom. The idea above is similar to what is explained about the Satan. The Satan is not, is, the Satan is what causes us to sin. But in its origin, the Satan, in the origin, we're in the, in the cosmos, 
Not when the sultan comes down here. The sultan is in its source. It's the same shamayim. It wants to make you sin, not because it wants to make you really sin. It wants you to have the incentive to sin so that if you don't, you will bring a nachas roch to Hashem. So his job is to do his job very well so that we have what we have a challenge. When you overcome the challenge, the sudden gains from that. He wants really, you should not listen to him. Panina, no, Panina, Chana, mm -hmm. talked about that. Chana had no children. Panina used to tease her. How can you have no children? How can I do? I have 10 years, I have no children. Huh? She teased her in order for her to daven more because she saw Chana was like giving up. So Panina wants her to daven. So sometimes in two things, there, there are, in their origin, it's the Shem Shemayim, although it says by Panina that after a while she started doing it uh, not the Shem Shemayim. Originally, it was the Shem Shemayim, and then later on, as you fall, you start teasing too much, you begin to enjoy the teasing. The Sutton, likewise, he means the Shem Shemayim, but the Sutton comes down here and starts feeling uh, the, the effect of his Haslacha, his success in making a personal sin, then he remains kind of happy if the person sins. But in origin, it's powerful energy. The same is true with Asa. Similarly, regarding Asa, he says in the last paragraph, as he was born from Yitzchak, that is from the perspective of his head, the starting point of Asa, where he comes from Yitzchak, right directly, and his spiritual source in and, and of themselves, he was good. However, when the head and source above descended and became connected with, with and, and invested in Asa's body, which was pure evil, the spark of holiness was unable to radiate therein. The dynamic echoes the idea expressed by the verse, the lamp of the wicked will flicker and extinguish. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a preview of what the Rebbe is going to say in the next, next part. We said that Avram and Yitzchak's avoidance Hashem is a direct cause as to why each one had a different type of bad child, of an alienated child. How did Avram serve Hashem in terms of his outreach and how did Yitzchak? What was their method? So we know Avram. Avram Avinu, he says, you stay where you are. You don't, I'm not asking for any kind of, um, you know, you don't have to learn uh, Black Gemara or learn a mimer. You don't have to become a different person. Stay where you are in your own in your own little world, and I will reach out to you. Nobody is left out if you're Avram Avinu. Everyone can be affected. Avram says, I will get even the Arab who davens, who, who, davens, who prays to the to the dust of his feet and worships idols to the lowest degree, I will get even that person to acknowledge that Hashem is the one to serve and make a blessing when you eat. He didn't let them eat without, you wanna eat, you wanna eat without blessing? You gotta pay for it. So he forced them, and the says they got into it and they, they, they began to get the habit of making brachas before they ate, even after they left Abraham. So he got everyone to, be a, to have a certain level of knowledge of monotheism, believing in one God. There was no limit to his outreach. Everyone was, you know, was capable of getting Avram Avinu's chesed. Avram stands for chesed. Chesed is, I come to you. You don't have to come to me. Like light, no sunlight radiates. All you have to do is just stay there and you'll get it. You know, there's nothing you have to do. Just walk outside, the sun is shining and it will radiate, it will heat you up. Okay, so Avram Avinu is chesed, heat, uh, love, extension to all. Yitzchak dug wells. What does digging wells represent? There's water. Chafirot Beirot. He dug wells. Wells? How do you find water in a well? You gotta dig and dig and dig and dig, get rid of all the rubble, all the dirt. Like yeah, he is removing the hell and removing that which blocks the water, and then the water is right there. Yitzchak didn't pour water into a hole. There was no outside influence. He's working on you, change from within. I'm not going to shed light on you. You're in the dark. Find the light. Work on yourself. Realize that you have it within you. I want, I want you to be refined, not from without, but from within. Don't wait to my influence come up to me come to my level work on yourself transform yourself that's called guru it's more like fire rising rise to my level rather than mayim avram is compared to water where avram reaches out like waterfalls going down stay where you are i will reach you 
here I come. My outreach has no limits. Everyone is willing. Is 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 open. I'm open to everyone. Yitzchak, oh no no, he scrutinizes work and work. So which one is better? So the Rebbe says, well, on the one hand, the first glance, Yitzchak is the better because Yitzchak gets you to change and become transformed. He doesn't accept anyone who's not you know in the in you know if you're not really into it, you're not in it innately in it, you're left out. He doesn't deal with people that are grub, that are coarse grass. He deals with people that are willing to change. Okay. Abraham Avinu, on the other hand, didn't change people. But there's also an advantage of Abraham over Yitzchak. Because Abraham was able to reach people even in their crassness, in their coarseness, in the He was able to get real crass people to also say Baruch Hashem. Yitzchak can only reach you in your refined state, but in your pre-non-refined state, you're left out. So although he's, when he affects you, he affects you more deeply, but it's very easy, very easy. If you ever fall back from that relationship, you're gone. Because in your pre-refined state, you never witness anything good. You have to change to feel a connection. So if you maintain that, fine. But if you don't maintain that transformation, you lose it. Take, for example, you know, a person who, I'm a you meet a person on the Mipsoyim and uh, get this woman to light candles. She's not keeping anything, keeping Shabbos, not keeping anything, but she's really enjoying the lighting of candles. She enjoys that. And little by little, maybe you're going to get her to, you know, slowly, but... They go and eat out, not kosher, not Shabbos, you know. Basically, nothing's changed in her life except like the Shabbos candles have affected her. The light of the Shabbos, she likes that. And she can and she, and she likes, she might even say a few brachas here and there. So even if this person is going to be, you know, uh, living her lifestyle, she's witness. I can live my lifestyle as a free person completely free from any religion, and yet I can enjoy the feel of Shabbos. It's nice. It's beautiful. It means a lot to me. How about a person that you really worked on to change? In their pre-state, in their non from state, they hated everything. Don't leave me alone with your Shabbos candles. I'm not interested. And somehow this person witnessed a very a, a transformation in life and really made a major change and accepted everything. They keep Shabbos, they keep kosher, they keep everything. But then there's peer pressure, and then he, and they, something happens after a while. Living in a, you, know, you live in Idaho, or you live in Wyoming, you're not living exactly in Borough Park or Crown Heights, and you get affected by your family, peer pressure, college, you know, things you see there. And slowly but surely, what happens? Relapse. In that state now, you've never witnessed being non prom and keeping anything. Only when you transform yourself, then you started keeping religion. But in your crass level where your religion meant nothing to you and you laughed at it and ridiculed it, you had no relationship. So if you fall back, you're, you're gone. On the one hand, when you're in, you're in. But if you ever fall back, forget about it. That's the Esau versus Ishmael. Esau was Yitzchak's product, which means like this. Esau had to, Yitzchak had to have two children. One a product of who Yitzchak is privately to himself, his private level serving Hashem, which was incredible. <laughs> Yitzchak was an Olet Mima, was an unblemished sacrifice. So he had a great son, Yaakov, who was just naturally holy and pure, pristine, sat and learned a whole day, MS, truthful, as refined as you can possibly imagine. But then there's Yitzchak's outreach level, which is, I will change you. So he had a child that was an embodiment of that of Oga. The child was a bad child, but intrinsically, innately, from the head, he's Yitzchak's extension. He's Jewish. Why is it that Asa fell so far and never did Shuvah? As I said before, if your connection is only if you're relate, if you relate to your holiness, Asa had a terrible body. He had terrible tendencies from his body. And that 
messed him up. Because if your only relationship is when you, if your only relationship to your to your to, to God is through your source, the moment you detach yourself from your source, you have no, you're gone, you're finished. Like this person who was from and trans, you know, started really believing in everything and then got pulled back again to the other world. Finished. Ah, nothing left. Ishmael, on the other hand, was someone who witnessed a relationship with, with, with godliness, even while he was the old Ishmael, the non-good good, good guy. So for him, you can't fall too far. Even in his fallen state, he was able to, you know, he was the embodiment of, he was the embodiment, he was the embodiment of, of Romovino's impact on the world out there. You can be as crass as you want, and you'll still have a relationship with Avram Avinu. And you'll never fall. You'll never fall. You can't fall too far. Because even in your most distant state, you still had a connection. So whatever happens, you're still going to remain with that Shabbos lift or Tefillin or something. Because you never had to change to have that. So even if you fall back, you can't, it'll still remain. And in fact, little by little, you might actually do children, which is the case with Yishmoel. Ace of its six dreams. On the one hand, you're extremely close, but the moment you lose that closeness, you fall very, very far, and there's no desire to do any children anymore. You're gone. Like a complete disconnect from the head of Ace of, the intrinsic level of Ace of as he is connected to Yitzchak, and the rest of Ace of. His choices of, you know, just completely abandoning everything. So if you wait for a person to change, on the one hand, it's good. because you change. But if, if that's the only way that person behaves, then what happens if that stops? Pretty sad story. So this is what the Rebbe is saying concerning Yitzchak. And now, uh, Yaakov Avina, by the way, where is he coming? He had both qualities. He had the power of Avram to reach to anyone. But by the way, Avram and Yaakov had one thing in common, which Yitzchak lacked. They traveled outside of Israel. Yitzchak could not travel outside of Israel. He didn't have a connection with unholy land. A land, but only if a land is holy can I deal with it. I can't deal with unholiness. Avram and Yaakov both left. And both did outreach in the same way. The difference is Avram in his level was, you're not Jewish, but you'll behave. Yaakov says, I'll reach you and you will become transformed and you'll behave also, having both qualities together. Tran complete transformation, and no questioning that you're going to fall out of it. You're not going to fall out of it. It'll remain with you. It'll stick. A transformation where there's no room for any kind of relapse whatsoever. Having both qualities, both of Avram and Yitzchak. Um, the Rebbe gives us in, in, in five a very interesting halakhic parallel. You ever hear the idea you could send a shliach, an agent? You know, if someone wants to marry a woman or divorce, the guy who's marrying the woman can actually say, I, I don't want to, I, I can't be there at the chasna. It's kind of weird. Divorce is more, more plausible. But the guy said, I can't be at the wedding. I, you know, I'm not feeling very well. I can't travel. Oh, there's, you know, there's restrictions on traveling. I don't want to get the uh, vaccine. So I have a problem. I can't travel. And I, I want to marry her today. Can you, <laughs> can you, in my behalf, Take the ring and say Hareya to so and so. The din is if he does that, if, she, if that Shliach does so, you are married. Not the Shliach. You are married to this woman. The story was that Shliach decided that he wants her and he's married. <laughs> but a, a, the law is an agency is very, very interesting. How, how does it work? I didn't marry her. I didn't give her anything. How does Shlichus work? Everybody understand how, how, does, how does it work? It doesn't make any sense. The question is, we know it doesn't make any sense, but what is the novelty of Shlichus? There are two ways to understand it. One seems to mirror Avram Avinu, one seems to mirror Yitzchak. What do I mean by that? So let's take a look at, at five. Take a look at five. We can su suggest that the two approaches or definitions of Shlichus provide a halakhic parallel, the difference in the relationship between Avram and Yishmael and Yitzchak and the Esau. One approach is that a Shliach remains an independent being, He's not you, he's someone else. 
His actions are his actions. His giving the ring is his giving the ring to this woman. But by force of Torah law, when the Mishaleach, Mishaleach means the sender, the guy who's getting married, appoints him as his Shaliach, the Shaliach's actions are, he says on the next page, are attributed, Mishaches, to the Mishaleach. In other words, there's no intrinsic relationship. You are not me, you are you. In spite of the fact that you are you and not me, if I appoint you, the appointing gives and I empower you to do things for me. You're doing it, I get the credit. You gave her the ring, I am married. Or perhaps, you know why when you give the ring, I am married? Because your actions are really my actions. The Torah has the ability to transform the shliach into the mishaleach. It's not because, in spite of the fact that you are you, I get the credit. You become me. That's why it works. So does the power of shliach was transform the shliach into the mishaleach? And it's as if the sender, the husband, the guy who was getting married, married her. You didn't do the action. He did the action. It just went through your hand. Or maybe it's even his hand. It's an extension of his hand. He married her. He gave her the ring. You didn't. That's why it works. Not that he gave her the ring and you get the credit. So which one's Avram, which one's Yitzchak? So he says here, Avram would be, you are you and I am me. And I get the credit for what you do. Yishmael does not become Avram Avinu's real son. Yishmael is a separate person, yet he's influenced by Avram despite of his alienation to Avram. Avram reached out to him even though he's not in Avram's family, not Avram's uh, extension. He's not Jewish. Or Yitzchak, if I affect you, it's because you are connected to me. I only affect if there's an intrinsic, innate relationship. So the shliach, why is it that the shliach can affect? Because the shliach, with the power of God, has become the mishaleach. Because if you would be you, it wouldn't work for me. But you are now me. Esau is Yitzchak. But that's Esau's head. But when that disappears, boy, you see a different picture. You see a guy who has no relationship. Either it's either all or nothing with Esau. Either it's all, and intrinsically it is all. The essence of Esau is good, it's holy. That's why his head fell into the Marsh Machpelah. It wasn't the Russia. The head was holy. We asked the question, how is it right for a, whole, for a Russia's head to fall in, in Yitzchak's lap? Because the head of Esau had very powerful energies of holiness. You know the story that says later on, and she will come, will say, Yitzchak, you are a real father. Do you read that? Come across this? Why Yitzchak? It's a very strange Gemara. I'll tell you my brother's innovation in a second. The Gemara says that when the time will come, and Yidin are going to need uh, some Rachamim, because we have sinned, Hashem is going to go to Avram Avinu and say, your, your children have sinned. And Avram is going to say, if they sin, let them be erased on your holy name. Doesn't sound like Avram Avinu at all. Let Yimachu Akira Shem Shemayim. Let them be erased for your holy name. In other words, if they deserve to die, let them die. Yaakov says exactly the same thing. So Hashem says, ah, the old one I don't want and the, and the young one I don't want. Then he goes to Yitzchak, the middle one. Yitzchak, your children have sinned. Yitzchak responds, excuse me, God. Excuse me, they say. Your children? Meaning my children have sinned? They're not your children? First of all, I want to correct you. He's saying your children. They're also your children. And then he goes on and says, well, wait, wait, wait. How, how much sins have we done already? You know, first 20 years of a person's life doesn't count. Hashem doesn't punish for that. So you're punishing for the next 50 years. A person lives to 70 years, let's say. He tell, and he shows how of the 50 years, 25 years are involved with sleep and doing things that you, people don't sin during those things. And then out of the 25 years, he breaks it in half and it only comes to 12 and a half. So he says to God, 12 and a half years. I'll take six and a quarter. You take six and a quarter. Let's split. I'll take six and a quarter on my shoulders. You take on your shoulders and happily ever after. And Hashem says, ah, you're right. And it says, when Shiach come, we'll all say, Yitzchak, you saved us. You're the one, thanks to you, that the Shiach came. So it's interesting. Why Yitzchak of all people? Why Yitzchak of all people? The answer is because he had an ace of. And he loved him nonetheless. So his love for Esau is what gives Yitzchak the power 
that when Hashem will ask Yitzchak if children have sinned, he will now have what to say. Kitzayid b'fiv. What does Kitzayid b'fiv mean? He will have words in his mouth to respond to God's accusation the Jewish people have sinned. My son also sinned. Do you know how I treated him? Like my dearest son. Do the same thing, God. Treat him like your dearest son. I want to just tell the story. I know we didn't finish the city yet, but the Rebbe says today, or the Rebbe at the end of the Rebbe says, if that's the case with Esau, how much more so now where we're people after Mount Torah and most of the Jews are not, not to fall because they were brought up not religious and they never knew anything and they were like kids that were captive, captives by people who know nothing about Yiddishkeit. How much more so do we have to go in Yitzchak's ways of delving and delving into and finding the good in every single Jew? Like Yitzchak found the good, saw the good in Esau. We have to find the good, the good in every single Jew. But the story goes like this. I don't know if I'm going to finish it in time. Yeah. The story with, we talked about, you know what, a very Russian next to a tzaddik. Here's an interesting story. The Rebbe was once asked by a shliach in Toronto. Rebbe, I have to speak. I found out that all the people that I'm speaking for are not Jewish, and many of them are, you know, clergymen, to put it nicely. Pastors, galochen. Komer. Komrim. Lo yudim. I don't, want to, I don't want to speak. I don't feel comfortable to speak in front of them. What should I speak about? If I have to, what should I speak about? Whatever said you should go. And I think it was in Buffalo. This is the place. You should go and speak about Zucker, about the importance of giving Zucker privately. Matan Bese said that when you give Zucker and no one knows who the giver is, you don't know who the receiver is. Receiver doesn't know what the giver is. That's the greatest act of tzedakah. Talk about the mile of tzedakah that's done um, in, in hidden, in secret. Okay. So he makes his whole speech. Oh, and, then I tell, and tell a story. I want you to tell the following story. In your speech, tell the story of the famous Tosfos Yontish and the miser. Tosfos Yontish lived about 450 years ago. He was a student, I think a student, either a student or a teacher of the Marami Prague, one of the golem. And the Tosos Yomtev was the rabbi of the town in Prague. And the story goes that there was a miser in town that everyone hated. He never gave a penny for tzedakah. Nothing, not even the slightest. And he was a rich man. When he died, they buried him in the outskirts of the city, not to be any close to anybody, because he's a Russia. Not long after his death, people are trying to get buy things from stores, they would always get credits. They would buy things in credits, on credit, and the storekeeper says, I'm sorry, you, you, we can't give you any more credits. Why? No. Can't tell you why, just, uh, you know, we have a limit. We, we had a limit for a month, for two months, for six months, for a year, and that's, now it's over. We can't afford it anymore. Then we go to all the different gaboyim of the city, and they also say the same thing. We can't give you, we, we can't, we have not collected anything. We can't help the poor. They were giving, the gaboy is in charge of distributing money to the poor, all the gaboyim of the city decided that we don't have any more. And when the rabbi, Tosa came and he started asking, what's going on over here? Why, why did it stop? They refused to give him an answer. He warned them, if you don't give me an answer, you're going to get excommunicated. What's I'm the rabbi, huh? What's the excommunicated? So they said, okay, we were told by this miser not to tell anybody. The story was that he would give all the storekeepers money and tell us, give people free, sell people free of charge, and I will compensate for you. And who gave all the money for the gaboyim to give to collect for, for the, for the uh, collectors to give to the poor, to distribute to the poor? This miser, so called miser. He was only a miser in private, but meaning privately he was the biggest, I mean, in public he was only a miser. Privately he was the biggest balzaka. He supported the whole city. When the Tyson Junta found out about this, he said, I want this per I want when I pass away, I want to be buried next to him. That's the story he told. As he tells the story, a comer comes over to Rabbi Shochat, his name is from Toronto, and he says, Can I can I talk to you privately in a room? Comes to his room and he says, Can you tell me the story again? Okay. Tells the story. Here's the whole story. Can you tell one more time? 
Now he gets the guy is maybe a little bit not too normal. Wants to hear a story again and again and again. So he tells the story again. He starts asking details about the miser and about the rabbi. And then he says to him, I want to tell you that my mother, right before she passed away, told me a story. She said that I'm actually Jewish and that there was a that I'm actually descendant of a certain miser. I, I never understood which who was that miser, and she didn't give me any details. She just said a miser in the city of Prague, and she mentioned the rabbi's name, uh, Yontif Lipman Heller, his name was. Last name was Heller. Rabbi Heller from Crown Heights is a direct descendant from this rabbi. Uh, and uh, I heard the story, the first I heard the story from you, and it shook me. And I, I, feel, I feel like I need to think about my roots. And that was it. And I was shocked. Like, I let him go. Didn't have any conversation with him. It just, that was it. Eight years later, at the Kaisel, this guy comes to Rabbi Shach and says, do you, do you recognize me? He says, no, I don't. I'm the, the priest that was at your speech. Remember in Buffalo, eight years ago? I, may, I transformed my life completely. And now I am uh, you know, full beard and whole nine yards. So this all came because the Rebbe told us to say this, this speech. The Rebbe told him and the story. And somebody became aware of his Jewishness and decided to become a Valkyrie. It's a famous story. I wanted to share with you. Just has a connection is that very that Sadiq and Russia not to be very nice to each other. All right. Um, that's it for today, I guess. We didn't finish this as usual, but you have the English, you can read it yourself. You can read the Hebrew also if you want. Anyone doesn't have a copy, I have two extra copies. Up to you. And uh, have a wonderful Sarah. How are you? Sophia.